Okay, we go with the Kahoot kiss first. Hey, let's go. Ha, 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 ha. Wow. <laughs> I thought that this is super easy. Okay, phase one. What is the purpose of phase one? Safety check. Safety. Safety or toxicity, right? So for the safety test, I don't think that there are too many people are involved. So phase two. What is the purpose of phase two? Effectiveness. Effectiveness or efficacy. Okay. So what is the maximum effect of the drug and also further study of safety? And phase two is hundreds. Phase three, thousands. Phase four is officially it's not clinical trial, but after the drug is released to the market. And this is monitoring of market response. Okay. So phase three may be thousands. So one out of a thousand is low chance, but some drug has a side effect one out of a million. Then that kind of a number cannot be handled in phase trial three. So that kind of a monitoring later. Okay, for the old sold, old sold out uh, the drug, any kind of activity or the side product side effect measurement. That's a phase four. Answer is phase four. Okay, FDA, what does it stand for, FDA? Food and Drug Administration. Food and Drug Administration. Okay. So that is the FDA. Each country has their own FDA. So if the one drug needed to be the marketed, you should get approval for each country. Okay. Of course, the American FDA is most famous, but if the drug should be sold in Korea, then they should get the approval from KFDA. Same thing for China. Chinese FDA approval is necessary. Okay, definitely the kinase may not be the answer. And opposite one is a phosphatase. Phosphatase is a removing phosphate. It's the opposite activity of a kinase. So phosphatase is usually not cancer target. It can be different disease target like a diabetics or different uh, the disease, not cancer. HDEC, okay, we have handled HDEC inhibitor before. If HDEC is inhibited, what happens to the gene regulation?
gets more accelerated. It's uh, accelerated. Gene expression goes up, okay, making more product. Then those target genes can be what kind of genes? Tumor I it should be tumor suppressor genes. Okay. In general, tumor has higher gene expression, but some, some special genes, tumor suppressor genes are suppressed. That's why if, if HDAC inhibitor is used, those suppressed genes can be turned on. Okay. That was some example of uh, the tumor drug we mentioned before. Okay, we are handling three different generation of cancer drugs. Last week, we handled conventional cancer drug. Conventional cancer drug is the target is just the fast growing cells. So the purpose is just the stopping the cell division or stopping the growth of the cells. Main target was the DNA, DNA itself, or DNA topoisomerase or microtubule. Microtubule is, is the essential component for cell division. So that kind of a cell division blockers are conventional cancer drugs. This week, we are studying targeted cancer therapy. Here, the targeted means, which is a selective only for cancer by attacking one point of a signal transduction. Okay, so that's why this is targeted cancer therapy. We need to know single molecular target. Many of them can be kinase. And those kinase has a two big class. One is a tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine has a hydroxy group. That's why this is a, depending on the substrate. Substrate is a tyrosine, it's a phenol group. And serine kinase is alkyl alcohol. Those are two big classes of uh, the kinases. We briefly mentioned last, uh, the last class, CDK. CDK was a checkpoint of what process? Cell division. Cell cycle. Cell cycle, okay. It's a similar meaning, but you know, a little more specific term is a cell cycle rather than cell division, okay? So during those cell division, there are several different checkpoint. Those checkpoint is once it is approved, that means CDK activity goes up. If anything wrong, then CDK should not approve it. So that's why in cancers, the CDK activity is over activated. So blocking CDK is a one specific way to attack those signals. So any specific signal attacker, that is, targeted cancer setup, okay? Okay. I just gave you the answer, so you should get the right answer. Among the other three, among the other three, which one is targeted cancer therapy? Tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine kinase, okay. Microtubule or top isomerase, alkylating reagent or DNA chelator, those are conventional cancer drugs, okay. Now, based on this, Okay, today I invited the four speakers 
uh, with the example of a specific target targeted cancer therapy for maybe a little too many. So that's why you should make sure that make your uh, the presentation uh, as succinct as possible. Okay. First one is uh, Doyun's tyrosine kinase. Second one is Sengan's Glivec, which is a very good example for selective cancer drugs. And third one is the Yangon's CDK inhibitor. Fourth one is not this week uh, the assignment, but the last time Dongo presented proteasome inhibitor as an example of cancer drugs. Okay. Today, by listening to these talks, we will try to understand what could be a good example of a targeted cancer therapy. Okay. Could you start? Today, let's do this. Um, no. Go ahead. You share your file and Okay. Uh, I'll tell you about Zorofenib, which is anti-cancer drug, or anti-cancer drug. This is introduction of Nexeva. Nexeva is an oral anti-cancer drug used to treat advanced kidney cell cancer and liver cell cancer that cannot be restricted by suppressing the proliferation and angiogenesis of cancer cells. It's uh, co-developed and co-marketed by Bayer and Onyx Pharmaceuticals as Nexeva. And it, Nexeva is a multi-kinase inhibitor drug approved for the treatment of primary kidney cancer and primary liver cancer. And we will focus on tyrosine kinase inhibitor in this talk. Uh, its mechanism is consist of consisted of two mechanisms. And as as I said, the uh, sorafenib is multi kinase inhibitor. And I'll tell you about what is tyrosine kinase. Cancer tyrosine kinase uh, is cancer. Before we know ki tyrosine kinase, we should know cancer. How cancer cell is can develop. develop. Cancer cell receives signals about cell growth from the outside of the cell and transfer of growth and survival and do to metast metastasis to spread to other tissues and organs. These outer cell signaling agents are called growth factors, and each growth factor is uniquely combined with several types of growth factor receptors on the surface of the cell membrane to transmit signals into the cell. And these receptors are called receptor tyrosine kinase, also as known as uh, RTK. And these RTKs include uh, VEGFR and PDFER. Uh, signals received through the receptor tyrosine kinase are then transmitted to the tumor cell nucleus through the through a number of complex signal transfer passes into the cell, resulting in DNA, DNA synthesis needed to multiply the cells, eventually resulting in the growth of the tumor cells. In particular, uh, VEGFR is also involved in the creation of new blood vessels essential to the growth of tumor cells. Uh, and this is tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Uh, Nexeva can work uh, inhibiting 
the tyrosine kinase receptor and it suppresses the receptor tyrosine kinase involved in the vascular proliferation stage of the cancer cells and cancer cell formation stage. Okay. And this is another mechanism of sorafenib. And this talk, we will pass it. Uh, then how, how Thorafeny mechanism work on tumor cell, not normal cell. Uh, because Thorafeny inhibits tumor specific signaling functions related to the tumor's mechanism of development. Uh, cancer treatment usually aims to, one is treat Treat one is uh, tumor specific molecules, and aim two is tumor specific signaling functions related to the tumor's mechanism of development. Uh, so, sorafenib blocks tyrosine kinase, and and another mechanism is uh, serine threonine kinase. Uh, we accepted the talk, uh, the receptor, and the signaling system will be inhibit, inhibited. Then cancer cell growth will stop. Uh, thank you. Okay, any question for Doyun? So do you go back to uh, the slide of uh, name of uh, the two receptors? Next one, uh, next page. Okay. So here, VEGFR, what does this stand for? Uh, we, uh, I, I don't remember. We as EGFR much as you, is related yeah. on uh, blood vessels to growth tumor cell. Okay, V may be vascular. And what is the GFR? G is on uh, GF is maybe growth and what can be F? F is fact factor, maybe. Yeah, it is a gross factor. R? R is a receptor. Receptor. So vascular endothelial, gross factor receptor, I guess. And next one, PD. P. Even though you do not know PD, the next one should be, I think it's the GFL. Mm. Gross factor receptor, not FFL. This one may be platelet-derived cross-factor receptor. There may be some typo here. So key point is, anyway, the cancers the accept eye activation signal from outside. Okay, those signal is given in terms of growth factor. Growth factor sounds like it can help to grow at the same time that helps the cell division. Okay, any of those gross factors are overactivated. Now there is a very dangerous chance if they lose the control, then they can be cancer. So you tried to say something, but uh, this VGFL or the PDGFL, these receptors only expressed in cancer. I, I don't know, actually, VEGFR and PDGFR is only exist on cancer cell, but, but Sorafeni inhibits the, this signaling is um, only 
only exist on cancer cells I I research. Okay, uh, go back one slide. If you look at those downstream of these two receptors, there's a RAS, RAF, MER, ERR, those are all kinases. And then it's kind of a sequential phosphorylation, the reaching to the nucleus. This is common kinase-based signaling, signal transduction are the pathways. This kind of a pathway is there are many. Famous one, maybe five to 10, but there are many and there are very complicated across talks, not just one line. So most likely this PDGFR or at the VGFR, these receptors may be overexpressed in tumors or they may have some mutations. So their activity is much stronger than normal cells growth factor. This growth factor should be very important maybe for growing or development. And at some point, they become overactivated or uncontrolled activation. So either copy number is increased or they have a mutation. So in the case, when we develop drug, those drugs should be selectively attack those only mutation, not to the original one. Or we need to control the dose may kill half of this, the overactivated one, but not touch too much of the normal ones. So that's why even this kind of a targeted cancer therapy, if the target is not very specific or selective, there is a reasonable chance that it may have some artifact. It may have some side effect, similar side effect to conventional cancer drugs because these signals are growth factors. Then most likely they will stop the growth of fast growing cells. Okay. So first example was tyrosine kinase. Now let's hear someone's clinic story. Today I will talk about imatinib. Oh, this is my content. Oh, firstly, what is Glibeck? Oh, Glibeck is considered to miracle drug because of this phenomenal success rate. Mm. Oh, when patients use this Glibeck, they, uh, it is a uh, hematologic response was occurred in patients in only first four weeks of therapy and 60 months of grievous therapy. 98% of patients have shown a complete hematologic response. And, uh, Eighty nine percent of patients are survived after sixty months, and the relapse rate of of this disease only about seventeen seventeen percent before the grievance is developed. Only 30% of patients with this disease, CML, was survived for even five years after being diagnosed. Oh. Imatinib is the drug for Philadelphia chromosome positive diseases like cloning Melogenous leukemia, CML, or these other other cancers. 
Then what is Philadelphia chromosome? Philadelphia chromosome is abnormally short chromosome 22. Uh, one of the 22nd chromosome involved in translocation with chromosome 9. Uh, the gene ABL in 9th chromosome is translocated to 22nd chromosome. So BCR ABL fusion gene is generated. Uh, these fusion genes are, are taken place in a single bone marrow cell. And most of CML patients have this fusion cell. So we can target this um, or these proteins and can treat CML. Before I I presentation about mechanism, uh, you should know tyro what is tyrosine kinase. Uh, tyrosine kinase is enzyme that transfer phosphate group from ATP to protein in cell, as we already run. Uh, this kinase functions as a switch in cellular functions. So this kinase controls properties in proteins. Philadelphia mm. chromosome have BCL, uh, BCR, ABL fusion genes that produces protein tyrosine kinase. Uh, patients have this, this proteins. CML cells grow and divide out of control. So they, uh, they become have this CML disease. Imatinib is a specific inhibitor of tyrosine kinase enzymes. Mm. This imatinib binds close to ATP, ATP binding sites of active tyrosine kinase. So they inhibit the in enzyme acti activity of BCR ABL tyrosine kinase. So they they are regulate the uh, this uncontrolled cell growth and divide. Um, imatinib also inhibit uh, oh sorry. Uh, Inhibition of BCR ABL tyrosine kinase also stimulates its entry of nucleus and it causes uh, unable perform of its normal anti apoptotic functions and, le and leads tumor cell growth. And Imatinib also inhibits the ABL protein on normal cells, but normal cells have additional abundant tyrosine kinases, so non cancer cells are not dead and continue to function. Uh, imatinib is given by mouse, and when it is given by mouse, is rapidly observed and highly bioavailable. Maximum plasma levels of imatinib is about 98% and it is achieved within two to four hours of an oral dose. 
Thank you for listening. Okay, guys, a question for someone. Oh, I have get a oh, yeah, small question. Uh, oh, in Philadelphia chromosome, Philadelphia chromosome. Yes. Uh, how, how can it works? I think uh, in a chromosome existing uh, nucleus, nucleus and it when it it is is it or randomly distributed on their locations? I mean, chromosome nine and chromosome twenty two can can reach reach each other. Oh, you mean how this translocation is occurred? Yes. Mm. In mitosis, oh, you know that chromosome translocated is uh, able to translocation. Oh, I don't understand what is your question. Okay, let me help you a little. This is a very unique part of uh, the Do you see my uh, the cursor? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is a normal chromosome, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. Usually, translocation happens with its sister, the chromosome. But in case of a cancer, there is a more unstable of instability of the chromosome. Sometimes they should not locate between different numbers of chromosomes, right? But sometimes it happens because of uh, inst instability. That's why some part of this chromosome 22 and chromosome 9, they exchange this. Originally, ABL is only here and PCR is only here. And when this happens, very strange complex PCR ABL connected together. Once this happens, now when they make mRNA, they make this conjugated protein over here. That's why original kinase was uh, ABL, uh, PCL, or AB, uh, the ABL, but this combined one becomes super strong kinase. And this makes overexpression, uh, overactivation of those cells. This induces those diseases. So this disease, the CML, she mentioned, CML is one kind of chronic leukemia, white blood cancer. So this is a very unique case. If you read by PCR around this area, then you can see this PCR and ABL is a connected sequences. And this chromosome is called as a Philadelphia chromosome. In normal cells, you don't see that. In normal cells, you don't have a PCR ABL. So this is kind of not single mutation. This is by translocation in the chimeric kinase. So that's why this kinase is a very unique structure and normal cell does not have it. If you have a selective inhibitor for this kinase, it can be really selective drug only for this. In the sense, this drug was very successful before Glebeck was developed with the CML, only 30% survived after five years. Two out, of, two out of three died. Only one out of three can be cured by other drugs. But with Glebeck, now success rate of this treatment, 98%. As far as you take this drug, you can live. So that's why this drug was a very famous in the beginning and very selective against the different um, the normal cells. That's why this is a very unique example we can use. 
And there's another behind the story. The company who developed the these novelties, they, for the clinical trial, they gave this drug almost for free to the patient. And that clinical trial was performed in Korea too. And as you can see here, the period of treatment is 60 months, it's five years, it's a long time. Effect comes from within one month, that's the first. And all of a sudden they are responding and cancer cell was dying, but full curing, it takes five years. And clinical trial, maybe they finished within one year or two years. And then all of a sudden they withdraw. They stopped treatment. Now, once they started to market it, drug was very expensive. So the patient could not afford to buy those drugs. So there was some serious social issues, whether the drug company should stop the clinical trial. They knew if they stopped the treatment, the patient would die. 70% of patients will die if they stop this treatment. If they continue, they, they can survive, but drug price is too high, too expensive. So that's why this story was quite famous for some time and make a story in Korean newspapers. Okay, today I learned how to control the UR file here. Seems like it's working. Normal blood, you should have a 99%, more than 99% uh, should be red blood cells. White blood cells, usually it's a 0.1%, one out of a thousand. Okay, this is also a little exaggerated. One out of thousand should be white blood cell. In leukemia, <clears throat> leukemia is leuko, means it's a white, okay? Leukemia is a white blood, uh, white cell of the cancer. In leukemia case, there are many white blood cells without a special function, just that they're growing. It's a typical example of the cancer. And there are many different kinds of cancers. Only this is CML, chronic. Half of the world of chronic is acute. Okay, top song, this is a man song. Okay. Chronic myose at the myeloid at the leukemia. In this case, for the first time, we got almost a perfect drug. And the mechanism of selectivity is from this very unique mutations by translocation. And that name of a chromosome is a Philadelphia chromosome. This is a very famous story. And in the middle of uh, uh, the presentation, someone mentioned this glibec is binding to which site? Do you remember? ATP binding. ATP binding site. Okay. Kinase is a phosphorylating enzyme. ATP is like a bullet. Okay. This kinase is like a gun. You load ATP and then you transfer phosphate to the substrate and then ATP is removed, okay? So ATP is like a bullet, kinase is like a gun. Now these inhibitors, if they replace the position of ATP binding site, then they cannot load bullet. So this is a very common trick to develop kinase inhibitor. But one problem is every kinase has ATP binding site and those binding site is very similar to each other. That's why to make the ATP-like ATP derivative drug is difficult to achieve selectivity. But in this case of a PCL able, because of these complex molecules, it has very unique size, a unique shape of ATP binding site. That's why it was successful to make a glibec. Unfortunately, after this glibec was made, within several years, this tumor has also evolved not to bind to Glibeck. So that kind of resistance is not only to the bacteria, even to the tumors. If you're slowly adding these drugs over five years, if you don't kill out the tumor right away, there are some survived by mutation and then they do not bind to Glibeck anymore. So now medicinal chemists that they needed to remake overcoming those resistance, remake a new drug, which is a different shape 
to bind to this mutated B, uh, the BCR label. Historically, this is real selective cancer drugs, targeted cancer drug, and which was at least one time we got a very successful case. 98% curing of cancer, that's almost a miracle. Okay, that was the story of Glibeck. Thank you, Simon. And let's move on. Would you take down your file? And next speaker is a young one. Hello, my name is Choi young -won, and today I will talk about the targeted cancer drug named Parvo-C clip, which targets breast cancer. Young -won, let's start again. Try to make an attractive voice. Uh, With a confident face, and hi, everybody. I'm going to tell you interesting talk. Try again. Uh, hi, everybody. I will tell you about the interesting drug named Parvociclip, which is a CDK inhibitor, and it targets uh, breast cancer. Okay, better. Uh, contents are like this. First of all, I will talk about the, the cancer type, which is the, the target of the Parvociclip, and then smoothly explains about the mechanism of the Parvociclip, and then finally, I will talk about many cases of resistance and general cases and one special case. And so, what is HR plus and HR2 minus? Uh, HR plus means hormone receptor positive. So this means the overexpression of hormone receptors. For this case, uh, breast cancer, such as estrogen or progesterone. And HR2 minus human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 negative, and this means that underexpression of HR2 receptors. So, uh, most breast cancer cells are HR plus, and at the same time, HR2 minus time. This means that they have many hormone receptors for estrogen and progesterone, but not much growth factor receptors for HR2. So the usually for the treatment of this breast can, for this type focuses on the hormone receptor. And also parvociclip is the drug for hormone receptors. Uh, but uh, parvociclip is aimed for the hormone receptors, but it is not directly effective for hormone receptors or each Indirective hormones such as estrogen and progesterone boost cell cycle, uh, which means that it makes many cells to divide and go to go to cell cycle and divide as much as. So this parvociclip acts as the inhibitor for CDK4 or 6, uh, like uh, this is indirective way and. If CDK4 and 6 cannot bind to cyclin D and phosphorylation of retinoblastoma protein cannot happen, so cell cannot exit G1 and go to a space. And so uh, this parvociclip uh, bind to CDK4 or 6. Uh, and maybe you know this content from the learning materials of this week. So. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, there can be many resistance cases for the for the parvociclip. First one is overexpression of the transcription factor named E2F2, which will be explained later. And uh, overexpression of the cyclin E1, E2, or breast tumor related kinases. Uh, you may also learn about the cyclin E and CDK2. This is also the uh, also the proteins that act as the uh, restriction point, like uh, like uh, CDK46 or CDK46 and cyclin D. So if uh, CDK46 are inhibited, but cyclin if there are many numbers of cyclin E1, E2, 
the cell can move out from G1 and then go into a space. And loss of the FAT1, which will be explained later too. First of all, let me talk about the E to F2. Uh, uh, as you know, the RB protein, which is uh, post-polylated, then the E to F is uh, get out of, get cut, cut the bind with the RB, and then cell can go to the S space. Uh, E2F2 is the transcription factor of E2F family. So, and overexpression of E2F2 hinders CDK46 inhibitors, but this is a little weird because the usually the getting out of G1 and getting into the S space is the downstream mechanism, which starts from the CDK46 cycling D1 and then go to the R post-polylation of RB. Uh, the exact mechanism of this is not revealed, but, and scientists say that the original downstream mechanism may be wrong. So the exact mechanism is not known, but for me, to just guessing, I think maybe feedback is one of the case, but I'm not sure, but just guessing, yes. And, Second case is BRK and FAT1. BRK is breast tumor related kinase, and this increased the activity of cyclin D and CDK4, or impedes the P27 protein, which act as the cell cycle regulator. So by this way, uh, this can develop resistance to purpose clip, and FAT1 is the protein which is made by the gene named the same as FAT1. And FAT1 is the tumor suppressor gene. And if this gene is up, so if this protein cannot be made, the number of CDK6 gets higher. And so uh, it can be resistant to parvocyclic. And there is one special case for the resistance of parvocyclic. Uh, CDK6, the number of CDK6 can be increased by the suppression of a signaling pathway named as the TGF beta pathway by particular micro RNAs. Uh, TGF beta pathway is a very complex signal pathway. In this presence, so you just know it as the way that cell regulates a certain target gene expression. For this case, maybe the Related to the no, related to regulating number of CD cases, maybe targeting. In this process, uh, uh, after uh, explaining this process, micro micro RNAs is uh, also you just know simply the very small uh, RNA fragment in the cells, mm, and these micro RNAs. H to tweak gene expression means uh, impede gene expression, which again means impede TGF beta pathway. Uh, interestingly, uh, as not the cases that I explained before the F81 or, or breast tumor related kinase, it, the cell's whole DNA is not mutated, it just acquired this resistance by the microRNAs, and also they trade these genetic materials to other cells by exosomes. And you also know the exosomes that we learned at the lecture five, and uh, we also solved the problem of this in the midterm exam. So by exosomes, they can trade microRNAs in nearby cells, so they can get, they can regulate or impede the TGF beta pathway, so they can get resistance for parvocyclic. So uh, the scientists also studied that because cells are not mutated, they showed to lose their resistance after some period without the administration of parvocyclic. And this case is a very 
uh, is uh, extraordinary, uh, I know, special case. So I think this case also can be utilized for the uh, research of uh, uh, metabolism of cancer cell, maybe. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Okay, a lot of information here. Question for Youngman? Um, I, I want to just... Uh, you can go first. Uh, for his question, I want to mention just one thing. In the introduction, you mentioned most of breast cancer has the HER2 negative, yeah. but actually uh, it might be wrong because I want to say there are two possibilities in breast cancer. There is HER2 positive cancer. Actually, it is more aggressive than HER2 negative breast cancer. So. It's just I want to make sure because uh, many of students can think most of breast cancer might have HER2 negative condition, but it is not 100% correct. Uh, that is a good point. So when we have breast cancer case, then they divide those classes. If a HER2 positive, then you have another drug to be used which will be presented next week by Sejin. So today, uh, this week's uh, the presentation, I suspected and I was right. Three of you chose antibody drugs. Okay, so those antibody drugs, I will invite uh, the three of you, Sejin and Tekjun and Dongwoo. So you will present those antibody drugs story next week. Okay, so this means Youngwoo's case, this HL plus and HER2 minus, if you get this kind of a situation, now your choice is not Herceptin. Your choice is using different inhibitor. Okay, that is the case. Now the, let's look at the name. Uh, Younghun, would you allow me to yeah. control? Okay, so here, the name of the compound is uh, palbocyclip. Last part, IB is an inhibitor, okay? Cycle IB, cyclip. This means this is a CDK inhibitor. So it means the CDK is one big class of targets. CDK2, CDK4, CDK1, CDK6, CDK5. There are many, many CDK kinases. If you have <clears throat> CDK inhibitor, the drug name usually ended up with a cyclip. This, is, this whole means CDK inhibitor. Imatinib, TINIB, T I N I B, Glibex, another name, Imatinib. TINIB is tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Okay, next week we will hear three monoclonal antibody talk. Those will have the name MAB at the end, monoclonal antibody, MAP. Okay, so the, some of those drug names it has uh, some systems. By looking at those the drug name, you can guess what is the, the target or what is the function of those drugs, okay? There are many informations here, uh, but we are not going to cover uh, the, all of them. So let's just stop here. Today we heard tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Glibeck as an, another interesting uh, the, the topic, and then one case of a CDK inhibitor. Now by changing the gear, we will hear totally new class of uh, anti-cancer drug. Next one is a Dongwon. Dongwon, do you take down your file? Yes. Okay, Dongwon. Okay, um, I'll start my presentation. Just wait a minute. Is this a Mac? Oh, yes, it is. Great. Okay, today um, I'll talk about the proteasome inhibitor, which is a different kind of a targeted cell therapy that we have previously talked before, as Professor had said. And um, to start, 
um, proteasome inhibitors uh, are used to treat um, multiple myoma therapy. And this is a special case, um, and it is called Tabarsong Korsujung in Korea. So the term is quite confusing, but it is actually a cancer that is related to both, both the to the bone marrow. So why the proteasome inhibitor, as I'm going to talk about it like specifically, specifically after in the next slides, um, but to give a general impression about it, it uses the ubiquitin proteasome pathway as a critical role to regulate this process in this cancer. And this is very important for the tumor cell growth and also it's for its survival. So inhibiting this proteasome pathway or its function have evolved and emerged as a powerful strategy for treating it. So um, even though immunotherapies and other various kinds of types have been uh, furiously developing out in the, in the past, past years, uh, proteasome inhibitor inhibitors are continuously being used because it is shown very effective in treating this specific myeloma cancers. So I'll first introduce what exactly a proteasome is. And proteasome is, uh, look like this, it's like this. It's look like a barrel shape and it's found in all, all types of cells. And their job is to get rid of the misfolded. So prote proteins get folded after they get their amino acid structures. And if they are misfolded and have function, non-functional well, non -functional features, they get to be disposed and proteasome helps this disposal, disposal procedure. So um, moving on, um, also, um, the UV, ubiquitin pathway is the general process of how this protein is, protein is degraded. So um, to give um, a short explanation of what the ubiquitin pathway is, it is, the, it is consisted of two stages. And first, a ubiqu ubiquitin is tagged into um, E1 and continuously E2 and E3 which is all ligases and different enzymes, which eventually helps um, attaching the ubiquitin into the substrate protein. So this is the stage one. And ubiquitin tagged proteins in stage two gets to move and be inserted into the proteasum. So this is in here, 26, 26 X proteasum. And it goes inside the proteasome and it gets degraded by three different catalytic activities, which is called CTL, um, chymotrypsin like, and TL, trypsin like, and caspase like. So it has three different catalytic functions. And as you can imagine, the inhibitor that I'm going to talk about in the, la in the later slides is using the, one of these three catalytic activities to make, to inhibit the proteasome function. So uh, in myoma plasma cells, the myoma plasma cells secrete a lot of paraprotein, which could be toxic and has to be degraded by proteasome or unless there are going to be degraded because of this harmful protein. So, when proteasome inhibitors are, in, are introduced to these cells, they could be considered as harmful and can be de de degraded naturally. So um, there are various types of proteasome inhibitors in clinical development. However, um, the one in the box that I have circled in the, over here, this is the only one that has been approved by the FDA. And so the rest of them are still in clinical trials. And it is called bortezolib. And it targets the CTL pathway, which is uh, the chymotrypsin-like function. So it targets this function. 
and it is injected by intravenous functions. Um, it is also called IV. And the explanations are shown in below. So if you want to get uh, a general description of what all these abbreviations are like, you would like to uh, look at this behind page a little bit. So it is approved for MM and MCL, which means multiple myoma, and MCL or mental cell lymphoma. So moving on. This bortezomib, it has a mechanism to act on the CPL chymotrypsin-like activity as I, I, I have talked before. And it looks like a boronic, boronic acid analog. So it has a boron, boron, boron atom over here. And this boron atom on the right binds to the catalytic site of the protein with high affinity and specificity. So when it gets attached, it inhibits that function and eventually degrades the paraprotein. So it's good for suppressing tumor growth. So there are possible many possible side effects as many other therapies do have. And it could includes peripheral neuropathy um, or tingling. So it gives very harmful effects with a high possibility to affect our neuronal functions. But still, uh, patients use this very often because they are willing to willing to uh, treat the diseases despite having these possible side effects. So many other upcoming proteasome inhibitors are trying to reduce the side effect symptoms. And these will be continuously developed to be continuously targeted to target the myeloma, myeloma killing impact. So this is my end of my presentation. And thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Tomo. Uh, question to Tomo. Okay, let's compare this uh, proteasome inhibitor with the uh, HDEG inhibitor. HDEG inhibitor is uh, increasing gene expression of some target gene, right? So increasing the synthesis of some protein. Now, proteasome inhibitor, proteasome needed to break down and then if you add proteasome inhibitor, then it blocks the breaking of the proteins. In general terms, keeping those high concentration of target gene, it has something in common. But targeting the working mechanism is different. One is accelerating the synthesis of a protein. In this case, the proteasome is blocking the breaking down of the protein. Right? Now, Tomo, anything known about the target protein of this proteasome inhibitor? Uh, excuse me? Any known target? Let's just say HTAG inhibitor, we say tumor suppressed gene was uh, overexpressed, right? In this case, proteasome inhibitor is used, then what protein is blocked? What protein breaking down was blocked? Anything known about it? Um. Actually, uh, one of this protein example is the paraprotein. Oh, it's over here. Um, it is the only one I found. So there will be other many cases, but I don't exactly know what it is. So this paraprotein is, is an example that is overexpressed in myeloma cells. Paraprotein is a anti tumor or pro tumor? Oh, um, so this is kind of. Um, not exactly related to the function to regulate the protein to the to regulate the tumor function, but actually this protein is kind of an it has an eccentric function, so it is included inside the tumor, but we don't know what exactly why. But still, if it's it is overexpressed, um, it could be harmful to the tumor cell. So I guess that it could be tumor inhibiting. So, okay. Yeah. That means in tumor, the proteasome activity is high, higher than normal cells? Um, uh, 
Well, I guess so. Yes. Yes, we may uh, guess so. Because these uh, the cancer cells, they generate a lot of toxic materials, so-called paraproteins. Then if the tumor, tumor cells do not remove these proteins, then it's uh, too toxic. So tumor cannot survive. That's why they accelerate to break down those kind of uh, toxic proteins. That's why they have a higher proteasome activity. And then if you block that garbage treatment the, uh, the system, block, if you block the proteasome action, then those, those, those toxic material cannot be degraded. Then the toxic material can be accumulated and they have a more toxic effect to cancer cells than normal cells. Now we have seen, you know, different kinds of approach here. Tumor cell may develop their own good ones and suppressing bad ones. Then we interfere them by let them make more bad things for tumor or blocking those detoxification pathways or we can block those nutrient supply at molecular level or angiogenesis level, right? So that kind of a different approach is possible. So connecting this kind of logic is quite important. How we should think or the design when we make uh, the anti-cancer drugs, which route or which target, which aspect we attack, okay? So you should have that kind of uh, understanding. Now, if you, somebody asks you or I ask you in the final exam, okay, proteasome inhibitor is acting as a cancer drug. What can be the target proteins? Same thing for the HDEC kind of example. So here today uh, we heard uh, the four different talks about the different approach of uh, selective targeted cancer therapy. So this is not proteasome inhibitor or HDEC inhibitor it's not directly killing the fast growing cells, right? So this is also considered as pathway specific targeted cancer drugs. Very interestingly, uh, when I invited you, three of you, as I said, three of you uh, the made uh, the antibody based drugs, but this antibody drugs is still different from immuno checkpoint the approaches. So next week, we are going to hear uh, the, these talks. Uh, by the way, Yohan, have you learned about the microRNA so far? I just saw it on the book, the Yuzhen Zhan and Tabra Wood. Really? We didn't, we didn't, the, we didn't manage the microRNA in the class, right? Okay, that is also very important at the topic. But let me think when I introduce that part. Okay, uh, Tomo, could you take down your file? Okay, coming back to this slide. So we heard these four talks today. And next week, we are going to move to uh, a little basic, the antibody and immune system. And then immunotherapy will be followed the next week. Okay, next week, we will study about antibodies and the mechanism, how to make combinatorial strategy kind of things. Same thing, the quiz is by uh, the Tuesday next week. Next week assignment. Already I found the three of you made antibody drugs. So next week, no assignment. Yay. Nobody's delighted. If you are disappointed, I can make it now. Okay, next week, no assignment. But now I will give you the time to read this book. Okay. The next week, we are going to cover the topics from this book seriously. And I'm planning to make it a little different format. So you don't have a time to read the book the next week. So next week, utilize this time, and then read seriously about this book, okay? Okay, still we have about five minutes of time. So let's, let me uh, briefly introduce microRNA.
RNA in our body. Usually, DNA is a double helix. RNA is usually single strand. If RNA exists as a double strand, it means something very unique. Usually, double strand RNA is coming from virus. So our body developed very unique defense system. If you see this kind of a double strand RNA, you should remove it. You should treat it very uniquely. So this kind of a double strand RNA is in general, it is called as the RNA I, RNA interference. That word implies that if you have this size of RNA, about 22 nucleotides long, double strand RNA, usually it finds its matching DNA sequence and blocking the gene expression. That's why it is called as RNAi interference. RNAi has two different kinds. One is SI RNA, SI, small s, small i RNA. The other one is microRNA. MIRNA. So this microRNA or siRNA, because of this emergency handling of the, the body to manage to remove these materials, this has a very unique function in our body. They do not attack DNA. DNA is okay. They just block mRNA or mRNA synthesis. So, if you introduce a new gene into the body, let's say this one first. If you remove one gene from DNA genome system, we call it knockout, KO, knockout. Once you use this kind of a term, now if you introduce an existing gene into the genome by retrovirus, it's inserting new gene into our genome. What would you like to call? Knock in. It is a knock in. Okay. You start with the one term, then the opposite one you make up the story. Knock in is uh, introducing new gene, and we can get foreign protein can be synthesized. Knock out. We delete one gene, then we remove the gene from our body and we cannot make that protein. Now, microRNA or siRNA, if you add it, DNA is not affected, DNA is okay. If DNA is affected now, that's CRISPR, another gene editing other tool, that's some other different topic. But this siRNA or microRNA is added. mRNA is degraded, or protein synthesis from mRNA is blocked. So this is kind of a temporary knockout effect. But it is not really knockout. It temporarily suppress those gene expression. This is called as knock down. down. SIRNA effect, microRNA effect, usually it is called as a knockdown. Okay. Much time later. So this SIRNA was discovered about 15 years ago. Within two, three of years of the time of discovery, it gets Nobel Prize because the impact was a huge. So after, I believe, after PCR, 1970s, after PCR, this uh, microRNA, the RNAi was revolutionized the whole biology one time. After 10 years, now the next one is a CRISPR. CRISPR is also another revolutionary technique which is changing whole biology now. It didn't get Nobel Prize yet because there is some arguing ongoing who was the first inventor of the technique. Once it is resolved, any time it can get Nobel Prize. Using this CRISPR technique, there is a one possibility was made, increasing those gene expression. So I didn't say about the technique, but in terms of the term, if RNAi decrease, then we call knockdown. 
Then the other technique you may call knock out, maybe. Okay. In biology, once they start to use the one tongue, then they try to make the easy opposite word or related word to extend those tongues. Okay. So today we studied about the targeted cancer therapy. So next week, before we go into the full the immunotherapy of our immune checkpoint, we will study about the basics of our immune system, antibody and also our immune system, combinatorial system kind of things. So that's for next week. Next week, as I said, no assignment, but be ready by reading this book. Then it may be easier for moving into the next week study. Okay. Any questions so far? So presentation for the antibody is Tuesday or next Thursday? It will be Thursday. Okay. Okay, three of you are to be prepared for this week's uh, assignment. So presentation will be on Thursday. Okay, it's a Dongwu, Tekjun, and Sejin. Okay. Okay, guys, thank you and see you next week. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay.